of the Midway Sunset Field economically feasible? I'd like to make this a true daily double. Yes. What is the railroad? You're absolutely right. Midway Sunset, and this, is, this was fun for me to discover, is the largest field in California, the third largest in the United States, and it has a cumulative production of 3.131 billion. That's billion barrels. It's all yours, Jeff. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you all for being here with us today. Legendary oil and gas entrepreneur T. Boone Pickens is truly an American success story. From humble beginnings in Depression-era Holdenville, Oklahoma, he grew up to be one of the nation's most successful businessmen. Over numerous decades, Boone has been featured in every business publication you can think of. And I'm thinking that by next week, he'll even be featured in the Big Way Driller. What do you think? Seriously, Boone built one of the nation's largest independent oil companies, Mesa Petroleum, and later reinvented himself in the 70s as one of the most successful investment fund operators with BP Capital. In July of 2008, Boone launched a grassroots campaign aimed at reducing this country's crippling dependence on OPEC oil. In television ads, on his website, in his best-selling book, and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's The First Billion is the Hardest. Uh, I know some of us are still working on that uh, first uh, tenth of it. Anyway, anyway he, he has spelled out how our dependence on OPEC oil is an addiction that threatens our economy, our environment, and our national security. And it also ties our hands as a nation and a people. His campaign encouraged an outpouring of fresh ideas and a new generation of Americans to become involved in the policy process. He's also a generous philanthropist. Boone's given away more than $1 billion in his lifetime. And he is one of the most generous collegiate sponsors of all time, having contributed more than $500 million to his alma mater, Oklahoma State University, divided evenly between academics and athletics. Boone's impact on American culture reflects his many interests and passions, including his unyielding belief in the entrepreneurial spirit, his leadership in corporate fitness, the need for alternative fuel development, and his prudent stewardship of our lands in the United States. At a time in life when many others are concentrating on their golf score or seeing how many places they can visit on a cruise ship, he remains a dynamic force in our industry. Equally comfortable in predicting the full year win-loss record of the Oklahoma State University football team just after one week of spring practice, as he is in predicting oil price six or nine months out, he is sought out for his insights and his predictions and his ability to base all of this on his solid understanding of the fundamentals and his ability to convey a very compelling case. His awards and accolades would take up most of the rest of the time we have, so I'll just say, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome for Mr. T. Boone Pickens. Said on the truck box CNBC, 
was at seventy dollars by the end of the year. That's uh, this year, fifty. Uh, I'm not going to throw in the towel that, that I'm, I'm not. I've got two and a half months ago. Right, right. Okay. Uh, and we I, hope you're right. Oh, I know you do. I, I, I know where I am. Right. I, I, I know I'm sitting in the middle of an oil field. Very big oil field. The, um, but uh, uh, if I miss, uh, I won't miss by uh, more than three months. By the end of the first quarter next year, we'll be 70. But I still think that I've got a pretty good chance. I, I'm not like the guy that was uh, that fell off the 10-story building. You know, he when he went past. They want to hear you. Now can you hear me? Okay. I, now I, that opened up another story. But okay. I'll finish this right now. Okay. That, I'm not like the guy that fell off the 10-story building. When he went past the fifth floor, he said, so far, so good. <laughs> okay, I, you know, I, I don't think I've gone off the building yet. But now the, the story is where he changed my mind. I made a speech in Midland, Texas, and, and, uh, and I appreciate the turnout here. It's this full house. We had one there, too. But Midland's a little closer to home for me, West Texas. And about 3,000 people there. And I talked for maybe two or three minutes, kind of like that. And uh, somebody got a phone call and said, We can't hear you. There's something wrong with your mic. And so I looked down, I didn't have a mic. So I got up and I was sitting on it. So it's falling off and I sat down or something. So I took it and put it on. And I said, Well, you can say the first. Ten minutes, he talked out of his ass. <laughs> That's the only quote I got in the Midland paper the next morning. Huh. So. We'll do better than that in the uh, tap midway drill on the show. So seriously, though, let's talk about it. What are some of those factors that we we would look to see that would help us understand? supply and demand, and when you can see uh, oil returning to maybe that price you put out there, 60 to 70. Well, it, that's what we're talking about, is supply and demand. And what got us in the problem a year and a half ago was actually the United States supplied too much oil. We had gone from a high water mark in 1970 of 10 million barrels a day, and we had gone downhill to 4 million barrels a day. Then along comes horizontal drilling uh, and multiple cracks of horizontal oil and oil. And we built our production back up, the United States of America, to 9.6. Well, that oversupplied the world market. You say, well, no, that's oil in the United States. But remember, the United States uses 18 million barrels of oil a day and imports half of it. So we import half of our oil. And so there you go. We didn't have to import as much. We put other oil that's come to the United States into the world market, and consequently we were always supplied, and that was it. Well, the Saudis who have always, it seems like they have always adjusted their production to fit the market. So me adjusted to stabilize, which means keep the price up is what they want, of course. If I am selling oil, I'd rather have $100 a barrel for it than it was 50 And so this, so the Saudis let us know a year ago that they would not cut to stabilize the market. So what does that mean? It means you, the United States, you're the one that oversupplied. So now we have a new swing producer in the world. It's us. It's big companies like Chevrolet, right? not little companies like I have. It, well, you, all you had, big guys. We got big because you helped us get big, right? <laughs> she said they got big because I helped them get big. I teed up two companies for them and uh, ran them in, uh, to your net. So I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the first Chevrolet. 
personally ever thank, thank you for you. Gulf One. Yeah. <laughs> great people, great assets. They, but anyway, so there you are. You're, you're oversupplied. What did the United States do? We started laying rates out in the United States. And the day, the day I made that prediction, we had 1,609 rigs running for oil. About two thirds of them horizontal. And today we're down to 595. So I said on that day, I said, you're going to lay down 1,000 rigs in four months. I was right on that day. So we, we're down to 595 rigs now. And we have 186 for drilling for oil, uh, for gas. Gas, uh, six years ago, we had 1,400 rigs. Right? So when the United States, when the price gets bad, you, the operator, me, the operator, we shut it down. It is the way it works. So now, you're oversupplied. How long is it going to last? The United States hit 9.6. We're down to 9.1 now. So we have already come down 500,000 barrels. Another six months, we'll be down another 500,000 barrels. So there's a million barrels in a little over a year that has come off of supply. A million barrels a day is a lot of oil. So what's going to happen? You're going to end the records. We, the business that I'm in there, we get a lot of intel from uh, foreign countries, especially old paid countries. And they, uh, the Iraq government told the, uh, the development that was going on in Iraq. Iraq's almost up to 4 million barrels a day, which is high as they've been in 20 years. And they told them to quit drilling because the Iraqi government was paying for part of those wells being drilled. Now, you may, am I, are, you, are you operating in uh, Iraq? No. But so what happened is Iraq, they don't want to sell off. 40, 45 dollars a barrel. Nobody does. And so there you have it. All around the world, everybody is shutting down what's happening. Now you have people get on TV and say, well, they can start that back up in 30 days. That isn't the way the oil field works. You and I both of that. You got it. There's a, a lot of work to do to shut down and a lot of work to do to start up. And here, I heard a guy say the other day, he said, you know who runs the oil field? It says those, those workers' wives run the oil field. And I thought, I wonder what he's going to say. He said, after that guy's been sitting around home all day watching television, drinking beer, that goes on for about a week or two. And she said, hey, in the morning, you get your ass up, go get a job. <laughs> so what happens that your crew, they got jobs. And to get them to come back, you're probably going to have to give them a sign-on bonus and do it. Because they, they don't want to come back and think they may be shut down again in six months. So we're coming down to a point where supply is dropping and demand is going up. How does demand go up? It goes up because it's got cheap gas line, is what it is. So demand is drawn up all over the world. And you are, uh, you're going to see this thing tighten up. It will go back up. Okay. Okay, well that's what we're looking for, is that nice uh, balancing out of supply and demand and give us a nice level price uh, to work with. Yeah, you, know, you didn't really talk about the Russians much. They're kind of a big factor. You know, we haven't seen them taking uh, military action uh, for some time in the Middle East. That's sort of a new, a new uh, twist. You're talking about like the Russian move into Syria. Right. What, what kind of impact would that have? Uh, well, know this. It's always good to know the enemy. And this guy, uh, Putin. Is uh, a cold blooded guy. Uh, he is still uh, unhappy and hates the United States because in 91 uh, the Russian Empire collapsed and uh, it, it was no longer uh, the USSR. He wants to put the USSR back together and he started with Crimea and Ukraine and all. He wants to be a world power. And today, if you look critically at Russia, it's a bunch of old people with a drinking problem. Uh, they make vodka and drink it all. They don't market it. They drink it themselves. And they, they have very little uh, industry in the country. And the, really, their income is all their uh, oil and natural gas is where their income comes from. So he would like to be a factor. It's real easy. 
you know, to go out there and uh, you're a professional, whether it's golf, tennis, football, or whatever, and to tell you you're going to play against the local high school. That's exactly what Putin is where he is. His opponent, our president, is high school. The guy who cannot believe what's happened to him. Here he is, wanting to get back on his feet, reestablish the USSR, be a world power again, and he doesn't have an opponent. He doesn't have anybody that's, that's you know, come stop him. Now, he also knows next November we're going to get a new president. And that president is going to be able to, I think, uh, do something to protect the United States instead of just giving up. So he's got about 12, 13 months to go uh, to be able to establish what he wants to do. But let's go back to the East just for a second. They got, Russia got kicked out in 72. Now they invite them back in to Syria. <clears throat> well, get out of the map of the Middle East. And Syria is sitting right in the middle of everything. It's very close. I think it's just across the fence from Iraq and Iran. And he has been invited back in. He, he's sitting there with options on the table. He needs to thumb through them and decide what he's going to do. But just in case, I don't think it's going to take a war to accomplish it because those producing countries want a higher price for their oil. Russia wants a higher price for their oil. You know, you can hate somebody, and if there's a chance for both of you to make money, you can forget how much you hate them. You know, and, and sit down and say, let's break the deal, you know, here. So we can hate each other next week. But here, he may be able to accomplish some things just by negotiation. In the Mideast, cut, they cut a million barrels between Russia and, and uh, the Mideast. But what are you dealing with? The Mideast and Russian oil just so happens to be a half of all the oil in the world. So he was able, Russia has a lot of oil, but the Mideast, I'm not talking about now OPEC. <coughs> OPEC, a lot of countries, Venezuela, Nigeria, those are countries not in the Mideast, but they're part of OPEC. And I'm talking about the Mideast only that he would have half the oil in the world if he made a deal in there. And I think that all of them want money. And I think you're going to see a geopolitical deal made there within less than six months. Well, that just reiterates the need for us in the Thanks. United States to maintain our ability to produce our own energy, uh, be it from oil, from natural gas, and other sources. So, hey, you mentioned prison of the United States. Do you want to throw out any of your perspectives on it? Well, I know. Who's going to be the next president? Yeah, what do you think? I, I somehow don't think Donald Trump is going to be who he is. Uh, but uh, we've all experienced, you know, especially you see it in sport, that you see a team that should be beating another team handily. And the weaker team keeps hanging around. You know, you score a touchdown, they score a touchdown. And back and forth. This guy's hanging around. I mean, he's still getting, uh, you know, the top spot on the polls every time. I would have thought he had faded a month ago. But he has The doctor, I know this people. I mean, uh, honestly, I can get him on the telephone. I bumped into the doctor in the green room box. Green room is where you wait to go on. Sometimes you get there or you're in there for 30 minutes. And people come through and you have an opportunity to visit with them. And uh, uh, Ben Carson came, came in. I know Ben. And we sat down and talked. And I told him, I said, that, uh, you know, you, you keep uh, moving up on Trump. And, you know, he's like, 20, he's like 21 to 19 or something like that. And he said yes, and he said we feel really good, and we talked for a while. So I don't know. Uh, Carson may be the, the guy. Uh, 
I don't think it's going to be Trump. Uh, I think if you look down uh, the other, uh, uh, I like Carly, uh, the arena, and uh, she's by far the best on the debate. I think she's smarter than the guys are. And I, she anticipates questions about as well as I've ever seen anybody. She doesn't answer before you ask the question, but as you start to answer questions, she's crafting an answer. And so she, uh, she when it, it comes her time to talk, she is ready to come right out with a uh, with a uh, answer for you. So I think Carly could be. Uh, Carson is not my first choice, uh, but I kind of grade all these people about the same level. Rubio is pretty impressive too on the question. He's very articulate. Now, not much experience. The guys are pretty young, 43. And uh, so, uh, who do I pick uh, right now? Uh, I am supporting Carly. I'm supporting Jeb Bush and Carson. And somebody said, well, how can you have three? And I said, well, there are 15 people. If you had a horse race and there are 15 horses and you own three of them, you'd have a lot better chance of winning. Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right, good. That's not to say you own those three individuals, but I, I would get your point. See, we didn't talk much about natural gas, and I know you, you have been very big uh, in, in natural gas. And one of the things I think that's on people's mind be it natural gas or even electric, electrical, that's probably further out, is just sort of the infrastructure to enable natural gas to be used more prolifically than just uh, what we use it for now today. So in particular, how can we, uh, when would we see infrastructure where we'd see more natural gas powered vehicles, more pervasive use of natural gas? Well, Grant, you and I both know, we're in the business, natural gas is about its most widely distributed resource in America. You know, it's down every street and up every alley. So natural gas is available. We never have been able to sell that for transportation fuel in uh, Washington. They just, they, they just never have bought it. And uh, now California, you know, they, they a long, long time ago, uh, they have, I'll tell you now about your state, John, you know, What's your question? At air quality issues. Right. Well, we can do it quite a bit. I know. You had no question. Yeah. I'm teasing now. And, but air quality issues that the state did something about. And, uh, and for instance, that uh, Barry Wallerstein down here in Southern California, uh, he, uh, he's air, uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District, AQMD. Wallerstein's a tough guy. He has air quality issues. He said, what are my biggest polluters? And they said, trash trucks. They idle all the time, inefficient, burn, everything else. He said, fine, what's it cost to switch over from diesel to natural gas? $50,000 a truck. AQMD has money and tax authority. So he said, okay, tell them next time you buy a new truck, it has to be natural gas, we'll give them a $50,000 grant. This was seven years ago. Today they give no grants and all the trucks over 70% of the trucks, all the new trucks, are on natural gas in Southern California. Well, what did that tell you? One, when you have a leader, and Wallerstein's a leader, he can make up his mind, tell you what to do, and has the authority to carry it out. Well, if that guy makes good decisions, he's going to look very, very good. And he looks good by what's happening. But now trash trucks all over the United States are going to natural gas away from these. So over 70% of the trash trucks purchased last year in the United States were on natural gas. So uh, natural gas is there. Uh, uh, a guy was in my office yesterday, and they're switching out they're in an asphalt plant. They are switching into the plant uh, natural gas away from diesel. And, it, of course, everything burns much, much cleaner, which cleaner is cheaper. And so uh, he told me, he said, all asphalt plants in the United States within 10 years will use natural gas. So what's happening? Natural gas is cleaner, it's cheaper, and we have so much of it. We got a 150-year supply of natural gas in the United States. 
and the price doesn't go up. It just stays at two dollars and fifty cents. So natural gas is is being used, and it's going to be used more. Of what's going to happen? Well, then, uh, one of, one of the, I've had a chance to, to read your book. The first thing is artist. It was. Well, I wouldn't know. Sure, we'll, we're being asked to talk louder. Come on up. Is this loud enough? Yeah. Uh, well, one of, the, one of my favorite principles that you have, or books that you have in that book, is it's all about the team. And, you know, here we are in this uh, petroleum summit, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm trying to inquire from you, what would you advise us as a California community of uh, oil and gas producers, people who are in the oil and gas business, of things that we can do to work more as a team? Because it, it, I don't know about you all, but it feels like we're kind of under attack a little bit uh, well, from, from people who want to take down our, our industry. The well, now what did you say? Take down our industry? You think about government now? Well, yeah. I mean, when you get a, a, a government that proposes, let's quit using fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. Yeah. That, that is always amusing to me. Tom Steyer from uh, California is a, a staunch environmentalist. And I know Steyer. And I said, Tom, explain to me. i got one question for you. You want to wipe out fossil fuels. And of the 93 million barrels of oil produced in the world every day, over 70% of it goes to transportation fuel. Gasoline, diesel. Over 70%. And you want to take out that. He said, well, I'm not against natural gas. I said, well, it's a fossil fuel. I know, but I'm not against I'm just against gas and diesel. I said, okay, let's say in the morning, snap, Tom Steyer gets what he wants, cut out fossil fuel. What's the alternative? You won't believe this answer. He said, I would turn it over to the government. And to, I know, laugh, go ahead and laugh. But I'd turn it over to the government, and with their vast re uh, research, they would tell us what to use. Uh, yeah, but in the meantime, what happens? You shut everything down. It's, it's insane what they want. Stop fossil fuel. What can we do better to work together as a team? You're not going to, uh, Chevron's not going to uh, go out and get uh, oxy. To be a team member with them, other than if in some way they both can make money. And yeah, but, uh, they'll say, I thought they're smart, both of them. And, uh, I hate this. You're an engineer, aren't you? Yeah, this is. What would know their geologists? Oh, you're a geologist. We can talk over can me talk. about engineering. We can. <laughs> okay. That, uh, but. Working together, companies can work together. Technology, you hate to pass some good idea you've got off to another company or to the industry. You try to protect what you've been able to create and all. But still, and so, uh, I, I'm not so sure the industry hasn't gotten more friendly with each other in the last 20 years. I was on the API executive committee and I used to laugh. I said, you guys had me on here. They had uh, the Exxon, they had Garvin from Exxon CEO, and I had the Chevron CEO over here over the Haynes, and, and uh, old S, I was the Oxford guy. But anyway, I was on there, and I said, you guys had me. I'm just a token, independent, uh, on this board. You just have because you have to have an independent on there. I said, you never let me uh, talk very much, <laughs> and you don't uh, listen to what I say when I talk, and, uh, and they agree, and we, this, is after, <laughs> this is after the deal we're having great, you know, and, uh, that's, that's not right, but you should feel good about us inviting you to be on API board. I resigned about two or three months later, uh, and, and that, that's not my game, but teamwork, uh, you got to you gotta do that. Within the company, of course, that's easy. Should never be selfish or protective of some idea you have within the company. Somebody may have an idea that helps your idea, and the best way to arrive at the best answer is to include smart people and make a decision. So that I think what Carson will do if he's president, I think 
going to find him. He, uh, he doesn't, he, he's not an expert on foreign relations. Uh, he's, he's a surgeon, but he's a smart guy, and I think he will get smart people in there. And he is smart enough, he can understand something if it's explained to him. Uh, you know, he, he knows, he can catch on real quick. Uh, I just switch on that because you're going to see different leaders in different roles. And sometimes a leader is not an expert on anything. He's an expert on being able to take smart people to pull together and get a good answer. So it's, uh, but leadership is a missing link in uh, Washington, I can tell you that. We're here uh, at Cap College um, on, on a campus. We have a lot of students in, enrolled at Cap College that are uh, pursuing careers in our industry. I bet the chairman has a lot of work. To we do, we do, and uh, we have a lot of young people. In fact, I think about uh, at least half of my engineers and geologists have less than five years experience. And you know, I think uh, you've been through a lot in uh, the oil and gas business and the business world in general. And I think uh, people of the younger generations would really benefit from maybe hearing some of your perspectives on good strategies to excel and take advantage of this type of a price environment that we're well, in. Well, I'm talking to a lot of students here. There are some students and there are also a lot of young people here. Okay, two things. I go to uh, a junior, senior level petroleum engineers or SMU this two weeks ago. I said, let me tell you something. If you have a good work ethic and a good education, you cannot miss. If you do, you're going to be one unlucky person. Because a good work ethic and a good education is a, a perfect formula uh, to succeed. And I got out of school as a geologist in 51. Do they know how old I am? Well, they do now. I'm thinking they can do that now. Well, I, I, I didn't get out of school until I was 35. Oh, God. Okay. I was a slow runner. No, I'm 87. And I have people ask me. Thank you. I have people ask me every day, uh, why don't you retire? And some of you are probably football fans to the point where you know the Kansas State coach, Bill Snyder. And I think Bill Snyder's the best football coach in the Big 12 Conference. I got K-State people here. Must have, yeah. yeah. Okay, Bill Snyder's a friend of mine, and he came to see me, and he said, uh, you know, he said, you're 10 years older than I am, and you retired, you didn't retire, and I did. I said, okay, now what? He said, why didn't you retire? And I said, well, uh, I paid for all my grandchildren and children to go to college, and I still owe those bills. <laughs> so I, no, I did, but I don't know anything. But I said, if I retire, then I got to figure out what I'm going to do. And I, I'm kind of, I used to be a pretty darn good cop. And I'll tell you what I did one time when I was 78 years old. I eagled number 11 at Augusta National. Arnold oh, Palmer, Arnold Palmer said, you had two really good shots. I said, no, actually I did. He said, you eagled 11 and you didn't have this. I said, no. He said, tell me, what did you have? I said, my drive was down the left side. I had 180 yards to the hole. I took a seven wood. And hit it. he said, it wasn't a good shot. I said, no, it was perfect. <laughs> but no. I believe he had a pretty yeah. good number, too. Bro. So, uh, where were we? <laughs> well, we were talking about advice to young people. Uh, in oh, okay, business. I want to tell you the Snyder story. So anyway, I, I told Bill, I said, i got to find something else to do. I've got, I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm still productive. And I'll have to go out and find another group of people get into something, do something, where I feel I'm productive. And he said, you know, I retired from football at Kansas State two years ago. <coughs> and he said, I have been unhappy the whole two years. 
he said, K-State's not winning, and we're going to have to replace the coach. And I said, I see what you're going to do. You're going to go back. He said, well, I'm not going to say that in this meeting. But watch what I do. I said, listen, Snyder, I watch what you do all the time because you are a winner and you're a team builder. And I said, I'll watch what you do. Yes. The next year, he went back to work, K-State, and he's 77 years old, and he's coaching K-State right now, and he's still a great football coach. So, you know, retirement may not be for everyone, but if you are going to retire, I think you ought to have something to do with others. You know, sit on television all day. And, uh, and so it's, uh, I, and I won't retire, you said that. Yeah, they'll take me out of the box the way it works. <laughs> well, look, that, I think that's a good thing because you continue to make huge contributions in the United States. Uh, you mentioned the word, we talked about environmentalism. I think maybe this is probably our last cover to cover. And, you know, for me personally, I, I'm offended when. People talk about, well, the environmentalists don't like this because I and the other 64,000 people at Chevron, we view ourselves as, as environmentalists. Sure you do. As I know you do because you have taken a significant I, interest in. But I got an award last year from our day. Our day, that's hardcore environmental. And the first time I spoke before our day, which is about 10 years ago, they booed me. They didn't even let me hear what, they didn't know what I was going to say. They booed me before I started. Okay, now they give me an award because they say you are an environmental and you, Greta, Chevron, are environmental. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at it. You've got to produce your own. Right. Yeah, so. but, but we do it in a, in a very sure environmentally focused way. So you do. I have to think that we could all in our industry convey that message is that we as uh, part of the lung gas industry, as a lung gas industry, we are very concerned about the environment and we take very significant steps to protect it. The, uh, I just thought of a, a joke I want to tell you. Okay. All right. This I remember from 1986. There are not many of you out there remember, but oil got down to $10 a barrel in 86. So Texas oil men had gone downhill pretty far. And this woman was going down Travis Street in Houston, and this frog was in the gutter. And the frog said, stop, stop. And she did look down and said, well, you, you're a talking frog. He said, yes, I am. Pick me up. She did. said, oh, my goodness. A talking frog. He said, what happened to me? I had this spell cast over uh, and said I was turned into a frog. And he said, if a, if a pretty woman like you kissed me, I would turn back in to a Texas all man. She looked at the frog, opened her purse. He said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Are, aren't you going to kiss me and turn me back into a Texas old man? She said, let me tell you something, pal. I said, talking frogs are worth a hell of a lot more today than Texas old man. <laughs> See, we can, we can even laugh at ourselves. And, and, you know, I think that goes over pretty well here at Taft, California. You know, I'm looking at the time here, Boone, and I think we may be uh, reaching at the end of our time together. I thought we were going to go to 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock? That was uh, the plan. I know you could. Uh, it's getting a little warm up here, though, isn't it? Uh, it's fine. Okay. No, you just adjust whatever conditions are. Well, look, uh, I am uh, I am pretty uh, compliant with the schedule, so I'm going to uh, just say uh, a big thank you for making the big trip out here. We knew you wanted to come out and be here in the midst of the uh, third largest oil company in the United States, oil field in the United States. Uh, any last words that you want to share with the crowd before we? You know, stage. I, uh, I've got another joke. Okay. <laughs> this, this banker had a customer, and the customer had three loans with the bank, and they all were underwater. So he called the customer in, which was uncomfortable for both of them, and he said, you know, he said, we got, you got three loans with us, and they're, they're all underwater. And the customer said, well, it could be worse. And the banker thought that's an unusual response, but probably he's nervous. Right? So he said, and he reviewed the loans. He said, one, we loaned you money on production, make more salt water than your oil, and the price of oil's gone down, and so that's over. He said, well, it 
could be worse. And, and so he went to the second one and said, we loaned you the money to buy the leases. You're going to flip them. And the price went down. Couldn't sell the acreage. And that's under Well, Now, it could be worse. Third one was, we loaned you the money to buy the drilling rig. And the drilling rig is now stacked. And no way to come off that. So it could be worse. And that, well, the banker, is, he is very frustrated. He said, well, how in the hell could it be worse? The customer said, it could have been my money. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, thanks again, Mr. Pickens, for coming. Uh, we have a lot of opposition out here to hydraulic fracturing, and do you think that environmental activist groups are going to effectively be able to stop fracturing? The, uh, no. Fracturing, I saw my first frac job, this is scary, I saw my first frac job at Border, Texas in 1952. I've been out of college one year. <laughs> I have never seen a, uh, anything damaged by a frack job. Somebody said, you're saying they were all successful. No, sometimes we frack and we didn't get enough oil recovery to make it commercial. But, and so when you say that, that's not unsuccessful, so you didn't, there wasn't enough oil to work with. But I've never seen, and I'm up in Pennsylvania last winter, and so this guy gets up and he said, let me tell you, he said, 
that there was a well up here, and I said, it, it, I said, well, tell me what the damage was. Don't just tell me that it's a bad idea. Okay, I'll tell you. It said they were flowing back, and uh, line broke, and they ran some uh, uh, frack water out on the ground, went down in the creek, and killed the fish. And I said, what was it in the frack water that killed fish? He said, well, it was salt. I said, well, let me tell you, I've been up here, and it won't be but a month or two from now. You'll start spreading salt on the roads. A lot of salt on the roads. I've seen it coming out of the back of the truck. And that goes down, gets in the stream, kills all the fish. It's a different kind of salt. Yeah, I said, salt, salt, pal. But I have not seen any frack jobs that may say that. My ranch is sitting in the Ogallala Aquifer. It's the largest aquifer in North America. It extends from Midland, Texas, to South Dakota border, across eight states. Okay? That water is, is from 10 feet down in the low areas of my ranch to 300 feet down on the higher parts of the ranch. But it is the same water at whatever point you intersect it. And on that, I, and we're drilling wells, there have been 52 wells been drilled on my range in the last two years, and there's probably another 50 or 100 wells drilled. I do not concern myself that there's going to be anything damaged by the frack jobs on those. And they do from 20 to 30 frack jobs in the horizontal hole on those wells. Never one problem. So the people that, that continue to cry about fracking, what it's doing, everything else, uh, they don't get any place because they don't have some reference point that some damage has been done. And the stuff about earthquakes, that is just a silly too. So you have earthquakes out here. We have them every day. <laughs> yeah. I believe we have another question. Yes, uh, Mr. Pickens, uh, when you mentioned the story about the banker and the three bad loans, uh, you were speaking really to a group of us to probably have some of those bad loans. We made deals on $100 oil that we now have to sell for $40. Now, uh, I realize in your illustrious career that you didn't do everything right all the time. You did have a few reverses, but that didn't slow you down, and I don't think it's gonna slow us down. And so, what do you think about the phrase if you don't learn to fail, you will fail to learn. The, I mean, what you're saying, I mean, totally agree with me, quit. And, uh, I mean, you are going to have uh, down markets from time to time, and you just have to deal with them. And I, I reached a high point of network all after I was 70 years old. And since I was 70 years old, I've paid $760 million in taxes. And I started out with no money. I didn't know anything. When I got out of college, I didn't know anything. But uh, I didn't have any. My family are not wealthy people at all. And, uh, and the, uh, in 08 and 09, I was uh, 4 million. I went down uh, two, million, $2 billion in two years. And you think, how could you be so dumb to have that happen? If you're speculating and you're convinced something's going to go one way and it goes the other, and you have enough up on the table, they'll take it off. And that's kind of what happened to me. I gave away a billion, and I have about a billion left. So it's uh, I'm not near as rich as you think I am. <laughs> Here's, here comes Alex. He's okay, Alex. Greta, before we uh, say goodbye to Mr. Pickens, there are two gentlemen familiar to all of you who have a presentation to make to you, sir. First of all, the Mayor of Taft.
Uh, it's a great place. If I was thinking about moving, I lived in California one time. Oh. There wasn't much oil around <laughs> Del Mar. <laughs> Oftentimes, tell people where I'm from, and they tell them about the city of Taft. They tell them the only problem with the city of Taft it would be utopia if it weren't for the fact that it's surrounded by California. So that's <laughs> the problem with Taft here. So we want to thank you for coming here and make it official to give you this beautiful belt buckle oh, from Taft Eldorado 2015. And you can wear it with pride wherever you go and let people know you are a part of the city. This, this belt buckle looks, looks a lot. This belt buckle looks a lot better when I lose 10 pounds. Uh, <laughs> All right, got it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming and visiting. You bet. Thank you very much for coming and That's a hard act to follow, but uh, our next major speaker is a very capable young man who's going to be able to do it handsomely. But uh, to introduce him, I'd like to bring out Mr. Trent Rosenlieb of Lynn Energy one of the platinum sponsors for this year's summit. Now you know the drill. You gotta pass the test. All right. Created in 1916, this club is credited with building the first such club in the nation. I'm going to guess what is the Taft Petroleum Club? He's right. They've all been right today, haven't they? You got some very bright people here, I told you. They should try out for the show. Now, I'll let you introduce our next speaker. Great, thank you, Alex, and thank you for introducing me as young. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of Lynn Energy, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Alex Epstein, founder and president of the Center for Industrial Progress and author of the moral case for fossil fuels. A philosopher by training, Alex routinely engages debate with environmental activists regarding energy, industry, and the environment. As they relate to the bigger picture of the benefits of fossil fuel and nuclear energy. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Epstein. inconspicuous shirt even from the back. So it says I love fossil fuels and, and to uh, preempt the question if you go to ilovefossilfuels.com uh, you can get one and wear it with pride. So often when I speak to audiences like this that are generally oil friendly people assume oh you're gonna you're gonna come preach to the choir I hear that a lot and I have two problems with this supposition. So the first problem is that the oil industry does not have a choir, right? Nobody who's speaking, right? There's not a lot of us speaking. Now, a lot of us believe in it strongly. I'm from outside the industry. Many of you are from inside the industry or you're in communities that do it. But I'd say there's a, there's a congregation, but not a choir. So one of my aims today is to take you from being a congregation uh, to a choir. So whenever I speak, Whatever the audience is, I want to make them more in favor of what I believe in, which is energy abundance, and the overwhelming source of energy abundance in the world is hydrocarbons or fossil fuels. So if you're a non-supporter of energy abundance and fossil fuels, I want to make you a supporter. If you're a supporter, I want to make you a champion. And if you're a champion, I want to make you a thought leader. So today we're going to discuss the key concepts I think that are necessary you know, to go from a non-supporter all the way to a thought leader. Uh, but the other reason I, I think it's wrong when people expect, oh, you're just wearing this shirt uh, for us who are favorable is actually this was not designed for you. It was designed for anti-fossil fuel rallies. So I thought I'd show you a little clip 
of me wearing this shirt. This was last year in New York City at the People's Climate March, so-called, which is an anti-fossil fuel rally, which featured 100,000 opponents of fossil fuels and one supporter. You hear what they're saying? Hey, hey, ho, ho, fossil fuels have got to go. I have a very different opinion on the matter. Uh, let's, go, let's go see if we can engage. Can we just go stand in the middle? assumptions, which are, are really, really off the mark. One is, oh, you must work for the fossil fuel industry or you must have been paid off by them. And I actually didn't even meet anyone in the fossil fuel industry until I had been making these arguments uh, for five years. And at first, the fossil fuel industry resisted me because, you know, my arguments were too extreme. Fortunately, I think they're realizing that the truth is not, should not be considered uh, extreme. Now, the second reason is that people assume, well, maybe you came from a place like Kern County. You know, maybe you grew up in some pro-fossil fuel hotbed, you have family connections, and thus you can't shake off your, uh, your, your learned love of fossil fuels. So I grew up in a place called Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is right outside Washington, D.C., which you may or may not know is not a hotbed of pro-fossil fuel uh, sentiment. So, no, and, and throughout my education, I was fortunate enough to go to one of the top 10 high schools in, in the country for math and science and I went to Duke University, one of the top 10 uh, colleges in the country, and throughout that, I did not learn one positive thing about fossil fuels. I was told many negative things, but not one positive thing. But the reason that I got into this, and the reason in retrospect it feels almost inevitable is because my focus was a subject that I think is the most important subject for thinking about fossil fuels and advocating for them, but that no one really appreciates. And so that subject is moral philosophy. So moral philosophy is all about how do we think carefully about the important issues in life? How do we look at the big picture? How do we really know what's right and wrong? And I talk about this in the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels in a lot of depth. When I looked at how this country thinks about energy, I thought this would fail any freshman logic class. For example, one basic rule of thinking about moral issues is you have to look at all of your alternatives and you have to look at both the positives and the negatives of all the different alternatives. And you have to look at them carefully. It's common sense, right? But when I, I noticed, hey, wait, my whole education, I never learned one positive thing about fossil fuels and only negative, and I never learned one negative thing about solar and wind, only positive. So how can I possibly get the right answer if I'm getting a biased discussion? And the other thing is, people are never very clear. One of the rules in philosophy is you have to be very clear on your terminology. For example, if you ever read uh, Plato's Dialogues, which has Socrates, Socrates ultimately gets uh, really sentenced to death for doing this, but he's always asking people, what exactly do you mean by that term? If you say justice, what do you mean by justice? If you say piety, what do you mean by piety? And so if I ask someone, hey, climate change, what exactly do you mean by climate change? Nobody's too clear. Does it mean climate changes? Does it mean we have a little influence? Does it mean we have a lot of influence? Does it mean it's man-made? Does it mean there's a, there's a catastrophe? Those things make a big difference. Because on one scenario, if Al Gore was right and we were causing rapid 20-foot rises in sea levels, and he also says we can easily replace oil and gas, I guess like Tom Steyer believes, 
If that were true, that would be a moral case against fossil fuels. But if we had a very mild influence on climate, and fossil fuels were indispensable for billions of people, then there would be a st very strong moral case for using more fossil fuels, which, as you might imagine, is what I believe. But anyway, I think that, that careful thinking is in short supply in thinking about the issue. And that's when I talk to college students and you know, go to universities, particularly ones that have a very strong animus toward fossil fuels, I focus on that. But I, I think philosophy is equally important even if you're already a supporter of fossil fuels because I don't, I think it's, it's really confounding and confusing to people who know the value that this industry brings. It's confusing, why is it so hated? Why is it so under attack? And today I'm gonna to give you three concepts that at the risk of promising too much, I think will make total sense of it. It'll make total sense of why you're under attack and it'll make total sense of what the solution is. So the three concepts, and I'll repeat them over and over. One is called the Hydra. Two is called arguing to zero versus arguing to 100. And three is called moral standard. So there's the Hydra, arguing to zero versus arguing to 100, and moral standard. I keep saying them over and over so that 10 years from now, you can give this lecture to somebody. So first, the Hydra. I want to make an observation about the political scene with fossil fuels. By the way, my, my timer is stopped, so effectively I have infinite time, in case anyone is wondering. That's um, if we observe the policy debate over fossil fuels, one thing really stands out to me. Actually, two things. If I were to use two words to describe the advocates of fossil fuels in the debate, the, the, the words I would use would be overwhelmed and reactive. Overwhelmed and reactive, because what happens is, there's just this onslaught of policy proposals to in one way or another restrict fossil fuels, whether it's anti-LNG exports, anti-coal exports, anti-fracking in every state and city, uh, the clean power plan, so-called, all of these different actions. And occasionally you might get one like cap and trade that doesn't work for the time being, but it gets replaced by others. So you have more and more and more and more. And on the other side, it, on the defenders of fossil fuels and the advocates, it doesn't seem like they're putting anything positive on the table. It just seems like they're reacting and reacting and reacting. So I describe the pro-fossil fuel side as overwhelmed and reactive, and I describe the anti-fossil fuel side as overwhelming and proactive. So it's worth asking, and this gets to the hydra, why is this? Why does it seem like just one damn thing after another? And people work really, really hard in PR departments to try to fight it in the government relations departments. And it's just over and over and over, and you, you can't stop it. You know, even with a conversation, it's just, you know, your uncle, if they live outside here, you know, raise it, like a million different objections over and over and over. Why is this? Why do they always seem to have the high ground? And this gets to the idea of a hydra. So, has anyone here ever heard of the, the mythical Greek beast, the hydra? So, the hydra is this multi-headed beast. It's this deadly beast that has lots and lots of different heads. Now, shout out for those of you who know of the Hydra. What happens when you cut off one of the heads of the Hydra? Two more grow back. So the Hydra is the type of beast where if you fight it on the superficial level, if you fight it on the level of one of the heads, you don't gain anything. You lose. But if you can cut out the heart of the Hydra, then you can kill all of the heads. So whenever we have a problem that seems like one thing after another, it's a good question to ask, are we dealing with a hydra? And in this case, the answer is absolutely yes. If you step back and look at every anti-fossil fuel proposal and policy, you'll notice that they have one thing in common, and that is that they are all based on the same goal or the same ideal that most of the society agrees with. And that ideal is the ideal of getting off of fossil fuels and on to green energy. So pretty much everyone agrees the ideal society is one in which we get rid of fossil fuels and replace it with green energy. And so if you look at every proposal, whether it's anti-fracking or anti-exports or anti-anything else or mandates for solar and wind, every single one has the same narrative and the same ideal. This is how we're going to get off fossil fuels. So even if you point out a problem with one or another, 
they'll still say, well, this is the right direction. And even if you even if you say, oh, well, cap and trade, that's not efficient, they'll just come up with the clean power plan. They'll just come up with another thing, unless the ideal is questioned. So the hydro, the heart of the hydra, is the ideal of eliminating fossil fuels and replacing them with green energy. So that's point number one, the hydra. So this is understanding the nature of it. Now the next point is arguing to zero versus arguing to 100. And this follows directly from the hydra. So once you have a hydra, once you have an ideal, you own the territory. If you're the person, if, if, if the debate is framed so that you're after the ideal and the other side is after the wrong thing, you, you're gonna win. So what happens is here, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make uh, a lot of your engineers, so hopefully you'll like this. I'm gonna make an invisible X axis, okay? So over here is going to be negative 100, okay? So about here is going to be zero, and about here is going to be 100. Got it? Just, just simple x-axis. Okay. So over here, negative 100, it's a moral, it's a moral axis. So negative 100 is evil, the worst possible thing. Okay, zero is neutral. It's nothing. It's neither good nor bad. And 100 is noble or saintly. It's the best possible thing. So on the current axis, 100 in energy is eliminating fossil fuels completely and replacing it with green energy completely. And negative 100 is continuing to use more and more fossil fuels. That's the worst possible thing. So when they have that axis, every single policy they are arguing to 100. They are saying, this is bringing us toward the good thing. And with every policy in favor of developing fossil fuels, they're arguing you to negative 100. They're saying you're doing the wrong thing. Now, if this is the framework, you sort of have two options. One is you can say, I disagree with the labels on the x-axis. I disagree that eliminating fossil fuels is the ideal and replacing it with green energy is the ideal. I disagree that using more fossil fuels is evil. I, I want to change that moral axis. I want to reframe the issue. But that is not what the industry has done, historically, and what Republicans have done. Instead, they've accepted this x-axis, but what they've said is, yes, the ideal is to eliminate fossil fuels, to replace it with green energy. Yes, it's wrong to keep using more and more fossil fuels, but fossil fuels are a temporarily necessary evil. We need to temporarily do the wrong thing because it's impractical. So with cap and trade, they didn't say it's an immoral goal. They just said, this will cost you too much money right now. But the ideal is still to get off fossil fuels. So in our, we don't really have a debate over the morality of fossil fuels in this country. We have one side saying it's an unnecessary evil, like, like Steyer and Gore, that we can get off quickly. And the other side says, no, 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 it's a necessary evil that we need to get off slowly. So there's not really a debate over moral principles. There's a debate over expiration dates. It's like people, are, people talk about it as an addiction, like heroin. Like one side is saying, well, you can only get, it's going to take you 10 weeks to get off heroin. And the other side is saying, oh, no, it's going to take 10 months. But I would question whether it's heroin. And I think this is what doesn't happen. So here's what happens. So they're arguing to 100. And what is arguing to zero? Well, let's take the example of hydraulic fracturing. I got to speak to a few of you last night, and I mentioned this example. I think it's illustrative. So if you take the example of hydraulic fracturing, what happened? Well, in my view, and I'll talk about the basis of this view in a minute, hydraulic fracturing was an amazing technological revolution. Let's say the modern version of horizontal drilling. The shale energy revolution was an amazing revolution for human life that was moving us toward the ideal of making life better and better. And we were doing it using this amazing technology, and the industry had an amazing story to tell. But the industry didn't tell that story back in 2007, 2008, when it was emerging. Instead, they let somebody else tell the story. And that somebody's name was a, you know, he was a quasi-documentarian hack named Josh Fox, who made a set of images in sound called Gasland. Right, which said what? Which said that this is continuing our addiction to fossil fuels and it's causing all of these specific issues. It's causing groundwater contamination, it's causing earthquakes, it's causing cancer. So if we're on our x-axis, this is what it looks like. So if you start up from zero, what he's arguing is 
it's continuing our addiction to fossil fuels, earthquakes, cancer, groundwater. And what is the industry, how does the industry respond? They don't say, no, you're thinking about it the whole wrong way. This is, this is overall a really good thing, no. Instead, what they do is they try to argue back. They try to say, oh, no, no, you're wrong about this detail about groundwater. You're wrong about this detail about earthquakes. You're wrong about this detail about cancer. So here's my question. If you did this strategy perfectly, if you could somehow reassure everybody about all of their doubts, what would be the best case scenario on the moral perception of your industry with this strategy? Zero. So this is called arguing to zero. So if your best case scenario in a rhetorical strategy is zero, you have a big problem. And we do have a big problem. But I think this, this starts to illustrate what's going on. So we've got the Hydra, which is this overwhelming set of attacks, but united by this one moral ideal. And then what we have is we have that moral ideal allows them to argue to 100, to argue us to negative 100, and because we don't challenge it, we argue to zero. But why don't we challenge it? So let's step back, because everyone is accepting on, on the axis of goodness and evil, the evil is to use a lot more fossil fuels, and the good is to, is to get rid of fossil fuels and replace them with green energy. And one of the great things about philosophy is it causes us to ask, well, why? You're, you ask why a lot. Why, why are we assuming that this is true? Does this actually make any sense? And to answer that, we have to go a step back. If we want to know what is the good form of energy, the ideal form of energy, we first have to know what is the ideal form of life. Energy is just one part of life. We have to know what is the goal in life. And if we look at this, this axis, it's really interesting that the ideal is green energy. I want to look at the assumption behind that green energy. And in, in particular, green energy usually means solar and wind and sometimes biofuels. But let's observe what green energy almost never includes. Well, if let's say that the real issue that people were concerned with uh, was the fact that when we burn a hydrocarbon, we put more CO2 in the atmosphere. We've gone from 0.03% CO2 in the atmosphere to 0.04% in the last hundreds of years. That's true. And we can expect that to have at least a mild warming effect. If that was really the concern, you wouldn't talk about green energy, you might talk about non-carbon energy. What's interesting is there are actually two forms of non-carbon energy that are very, very good, not as good as fossil fuels on a global scale, but very, very good at generating cheap, plentiful, reliable energy for millions of people. And those are nuclear power and hydroelectric power. So you might expect that if the issue, real concern was CO2 emissions, that the people who are anti-fossil fuels would be rabid advocates of nuclear power and hydroelectric power. And yet, who are the biggest advocates of shutting down nuclear power plants and hydroelectric plants? The Greens, right? The so-called environmentalists. So Green isn't about preventing any given environmental catastrophe, it's about something else. So let's, we wanna examine what that means because if we're taking something as an ideal and that means shutting down everything you do, you in particular should wanna question that idea. So what does green mean? Green, if you look up the definition, or there, there's lots of definitions, but there's a core, there's an essence that, that cuts across all the different definitions. To be green means to minimize your impact on the planet means to minimize your impact on the planet. You want as little as possible. Now this is considered virtuous, right? If, if a product is green, if a manufacturer makes a green product, if they just put green on it, they can probably hope to get another dollar per product just for putting it there, right? Because it's like motherhood. You know, who could question being green? Well, I think every self-respecting human could question being green. So let's, let's analyze what does green mean. If our goal is to really minimize our impact on the planet, if we take that seriously, and people do take it seriously, they're always shutting down developments, stopping people from building houses, kicking people off their, their land because of sage grouses. People take this seriously. So I got a couple questions if we want to be green. Question number one, if we could go back in time to when we were deciding to take a patch of dirt and trees and turn it into New York City. And we brought Greenpeace and the Sierra Club and asked them, thumbs up or thumbs down, what's the green thing to do? Should we build New York City? What would they say? 
if anyone said thumbs up, come to me after and explain how, but no, everyone says thumbs down, right? Okay, so that's interesting. We've got an ideal that if practiced would lead to no New York City. Let's take another one. How about having a child? Now for most people, one of the most meaningful experiences in life. Okay, well, having a child, if you want to minimize your impact on nature, having a child is the single worst thing you could do because you're continuing your impact indefinitely. It would be better off to not have children by this standard, which I disagree with, to drive a Hummer around 24 hours a day than to have kids. And the green groups know this. They used to talk a lot about overpopulation, which means forced reduction in population. Now that's not as, as appealing to people. But here's what the Sierra Club says. They tell young women who are considering having children, what they say to the, those young women is, okay, maybe you can have a child, but keep in mind, your carbon legacy for every child you have will increase six times. That's your carbon footprint taken into the future. And that's considered bad. So we now have an ideal that's against building New York, against having children, and let's take another one. What about the worst place in the world, pretty much, North Korea? Let's compare it to its neighbor, South Korea. Now, if you've ever seen, they have these great overhead pictures of at night, South Korea is all bright and North Korea is dark, which by the way, before the oil industry, the whole world was dark at night. Nobody seems to appreciate it. Okay, here's the question. Which country is greener, North Korea or South Korea, which has less of an impact on nature? North Korea is by far the greener country. It, it won an award, it was a joke award, but still based on facts, for having the, one of the top 10 lowest carbon footprints in the world. So they impact their environment far less. Now notice, here's what's interesting. South Korea has a much better environment. So human beings are much happier, but being green is not about having a good environment for humans. It's not about improving the planet for humans. It's about saving the planet from humans. It's about the idea that we shouldn't be impacting nature, we shouldn't be transforming nature. Well, in my mind, that's evil because human beings survive by transforming nature. Nature does not give us a good standard of living. It doesn't. We used to live till 30 on average in a good society, just living with nature. We didn't, there was no living in harmony with nature. There's only dying in harmony with nature. So if our ideal, is to be green and we take that seriously, that means ultimately we shouldn't exist. So I really think we should question this. So this is the issue of moral standard. The moral standard is what is the ideal by which we evaluate all our actions? And the moral standard behind green energy is being green, which means having as little impact as possible. And that's why they select as the technologies they support the least effective, worst performing energy technologies of the last hundred years. Because those have the least impact on nature and that they don't really generate any reliable energy. So they don't care as much about, okay, it takes up a lot of space, sure, but the main thing that energy does, energy is a tool of impacting your environment. It's a capacity to do work. Work means force times distance. That means moving things. So energy by its nature is a transformer of our environment. So if we, if we have an ideal, it says we shouldn't transform our environment on a large scale, or really any scale, then the most successful forms of energy are gonna be the most opposed. So what I'd argue with fossil fuels and nuclear and hydro, it's not about any of the negatives that might happen to human life, and every technology has positives and negatives. It's about the fact that, that we're changing things, that we're building things. And to show you the importance of this, how this sheds light on, uh, shed some light on things. I want to give you just a little overview of how you analyze fossil fuels if you switch the idea. So over here was being green, minimizing our impact, and then over here was maximizing our impact. That's the underlying idea. And I think this is a ridiculous way of looking at life, thinking of let's minimize our impact versus maximizing our impact. I don't define it that way. My ideal is I want to maximize human well-being. And on the other side, anything that minimizes human well-being is evil. So minimizing impact is one thing that minimizes human well-being, so that's an evil ideal. But if, if we make our ideal, if we switch our moral standard from minimizing human impact to maximizing human well-being, and we look at fossil fuels with that yardstick, 
everything changes dramatically. And I would bet that every person in this room at one point or another has accepted the wrong yardstick in looking at fossil fuels. And I, I want to show you that once you look at it with the right yardstick, everything changes. So once you say, I'm going to look carefully at what benefits human life and I'm going to look at the big picture, it's astonishing that the case for fossil fuels is much stronger than you think. And that's what brought me from a non-supporter to a supporter, from a supporter to a champion, from a champion to a thought leader, is, is this. I was interested in philosophy. I saw it being applied badly. I applied it myself and was shocked at the results. And I think the world will be shocked if they actually know the truth. So let me just give you a little bit of an overview. Since my timer is not working, can anyone give me a, where we are on time? How many minutes we are in? Good. You're good? Are you happy? Yeah, I'm great. Okay, well, hopefully she speaks for all of you. <laughs> Otherwise, you can subtly walk out. Okay, thank you. So. Oh, we don't need to New Scientist Magazine. I'll show you this in a second. That's fun. This is Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, rather, making a really good case. But before we get to that, Let's, this, is, this is how I think of the issue of moral standing. I don't know if we can put that back up, but this is, this is my moral standard. This is how I evaluate all of these issues. And my contention is when we look at the issues with this moral standard as our perspective, everything changes. So the issue I want to focus on today is the climate issue because I think that's the most contentious issue. The other two big issues that are used to criticize fossil fuels are the pollution issue you know, the fossil fuels can cause pollution, and the depletion issue, excuse me, concerns about running out. And those are addressed uh, in, in the last half of the book, Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, and in a lot of the essays uh, that I have free online. But I want to talk about the climate issue because I think that'll show you how the methodology works, and I think that's the most urgent one to be able to reframe. Okay, so this is, this is the standard. Now, if we're on the standard of human life, let's take the question that you most often get asked at least if you live where I do, which is Laguna Beach. So they'll hear, they'll, they might see me wearing this shirt, and I do wear this where I live. Uh, they'll say, wait, how can you like fossil fuels? Don't you believe in climate change? Like, don't you believe in climate change? I'll say, well, that's, that's an interesting question. Like, I might first ask, well, what exactly do you mean by climate change? Because it can mean 12 different, 12 different things. But if I just think about it myself, if my goal is to benefit human life as much as possible, to, act, to say I believe in climate change Therefore, we should get rid of fossil fuels. Well, that doesn't really make much sense because if we're going to think about the big picture, we have to look at both the positives and the negatives, or potential negatives, very carefully. And so, it would, and, and climate change, in a better term, is climate influence or climate impact, man-made climate influence. If we look at that, what that is is that is a potential side effect of using fossil fuels. Everything in life has risks and side effects. That's a potential risk or side effect of using fossil fuels. So I'll say, of course, we need to look at that, but would you agree that we need to look at all the benefits and risks of all the different technologies to get to the right answer? And people will usually say yes. But imagine we use this same methodology that's used to oppose it to say, oh, there's climate change, therefore fossil fuels are bad. So this has a side effect, therefore you shouldn't use it. What if we did that with vaccines? So, you know, if I have kids, let's say I'm vaccinating my kids in whatever the most responsible way is, and somebody says to me, wait, you're vaccinating your kids? You believe in vaccines? Don't you know vaccines can have side effects? Are you a vaccine side effect denier? Well, how would you respond? You'd say, well, no, but I've looked at the big picture. I think in the big picture, it's enormously uh, beneficial. I think the risks of not doing it are far greater than the risks of doing it. The risks of doing it, did I say that right? Yeah, the risks of not doing it are far greater than the risk of doing it, as in, as in vaccines. And that would make sense. We need to think of everything the way we would think of vaccines, although I think a lot of the anti-vaccine movement now is based on this kind of wrong thinking, not thinking carefully uh, about the big picture. So if you want to look at the climate issue, what you need to do is you need to look at both what are the unique benefits of fossil fuels, if any, and what are the unique risks of it, and particularly with the climate issue. So I think if we do that, we find a really interesting picture. So I don't need to get, to, I often explain to audiences what are fossil fuels. Hopefully most of you know. Although most, a lot of people don't. But if we look at the trend, so this is since 1980, year I was born, my parents were told, their generation was told, you need to get off your addiction to fossil fuels. Well, obviously they did not do a very good job. 
because we use 80% more fossil fuels around the world than we did in 1980. And I'm very, very grateful to them for not doing the so-called right thing. And I hope we continue to do the wrong thing because that'll make billions of people better off. Now, people say, oh, well, we can replace fossil fuels. They're not really that, there are no unique benefits. Well, if we see this kind of trend, if we've heard for decades and decades and decades that you can replace fossil fuels, and it still doesn't come true, it's a little far-fetched to think it's some sort of global conspiracy. And you might suspect, well, like any other industry, the best overall technology is winning, right? People find that we need cheap, plentiful, reliable energy, and if we use fossil fuels 87% of the time, maybe it's the best 87% of the time, more or less. And I think the person who gave the best explanation of why was Jimmy Fallon, even though he's anti-fossil fuels, but he, still, he doesn't realize that he explained why he should be pro-fossil fuels. Because Jimmy Fallon, one of the reasons he's anti-fossil fuels is he hears the argument, well, why don't we get our energy from the sun, directly from the sun? He probably doesn't know fossil fuels are energy from the sun, just stored very efficiently by nature. Right, he says, why don't we get energy from the sun? And Al Gore tells him, energy from the sun is free and it's forever. And I would certainly like something that's free and forever, right? So what's going on? Well, Jimmy Fallon actually explains why. Uh, I think I need to take it the other direction. New Scientist magazine reported on Wednesday that in the future, cars could be powered by hazelnuts. That's encouraging, considering an eight ounce jar of hazelnuts costs about $9. <laughs> yeah, I got an idea for a car that runs on bald eagle heads and Fabergé eggs. <laughs> Okay, so that seems funny. That was in about 2000 and it, it always stuck with me. So I kind of wonder, well, why, don't, why wouldn't that work? And later I thought, wait a second, isn't hazelnut energy renewable energy? Isn't it natural? Doesn't it come from the sun? Isn't it free forever? Why is it so expensive? And this gets to a fundamental point that we're never taught. Which is that Energy is not something we just get directly from nature. Nature doesn't give us usable energy for our machines. All forms of energy are manufactured, which means they involve a process, a multi-stage process. And it is incredibly, incredibly difficult and an incredible achievement to make large amounts of energy reliably for an affordable price. There are only three industries who have done it on any scale. The hydrocarbon industry, the nuclear industry, and the hydroelectric industry. And, you know, those are the most persecuted, which I think is shameful. So people do not realize that the reason that the fossil fuel industry is the most successful is it's because the, it's the only one that has a resource efficient process that can provide energy for billions and billions of people. And that means that to the extent we restrict it, let alone outlaw it, we're, we're sentencing billions and billions of people to earlier deaths. And to give you some stats, we live in a world where for everyone to have the same as much, to have the same amount of energy as the average American, you'd need four times more energy. Four times more energy, and you only have one industry that can supply it to today's seven billion, you know, let alone going on nine billion people. So you're talking about massive need for energy. You've got three billion people in the world, almost half the world, have almost no energy which is almost unfathomable to us, but what it means not to have a refrigerator, not to have a light bulb in many cases. I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, to be using things like hand plows, I mean, not to have modern agriculture. This is the, the lot that many people have. For them, their lives to improve, just like, you know, people's lives have improved in the Thai republics, they, let alone our country, they need more energy to power more machines to improve more lives. And if we look at the how solar and wind, th this claim that we should not only restrict fossil fuels, but also nuclear and hydro to use solar and wind, and you hear these claims like, well, Germany has proven that it can be done. Well, I wanted to know the answer to that, so I, got the, I paid two grand to the European Energy Commission, and they were willing to give me the data from Germany on a 15, by 15 minute by 15 minute basis, so I could see how does solar and wind actually supply Germany with energy. So it supplies it like this. So this is just electricity, by the way. Electricity is only half of Germany's energy usage. The rest is heating and fuel, and that's 0% solar and wind. But what you notice here is that it's very spiky. It's very erratic. It's very unreliable. And in particular, it goes the lowest when energy is needed the most. In the winter in Germany, which happens to be a cold place without a ton of sunlight. So what happens? 
Well, they might only get 3% or even less of their energy from solar and wind, which means what? Which means they need to have a backup or really a life support that's available 100% of the time. So what, they, what have they done? As they're bragging about being the greenest energy company in the world, their electricity prices have skyrocketed. They, put, they pay 40 cents a kilowatt hour compared to the average American paying 10 cents, so four times as much. They do that, but at the same time, they are still hitting records for coal capacity. So even as they're bringing up more and more solar and wind, that just creates more problems that they need coal to solve. If all of those solar and wind things were shut down tomorrow, they would be left with a more reliable grid and plenty of energy. If the coal was shut down or 20% of it was shut down, that would be a major catastrophe for the country. So fossil fuels, there's really no such thing as wind power. There's just gas wind and coal wind and nuclear wind and same with solar. There's gas solar and coal solar and wind solar and, and um, not wind solar, they wish, and nuclear solar. So these are parasitical forms of energy. So the fact that we're talking about getting rid of the best forms of energy and replacing them with the worst and hoping for the best means that our thinking is not guided by human life as our standard. It's guided by being green. We're, using, we're talking about solar and wind because they're supposedly natural. It's supposedly magical and good to get your energy directly from the sun and the wind, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. And it shouldn't. The best form of energy shouldn't be the most natural. It should be the most beneficial to human life. We want energy abundance, not energy poverty. And green energy is, is energy poverty. So even before we get to the issue of climate, which I'll get to now, we know that the focus of the anti-fossil fuel movement is not human life because they do not care about the fact that what they propose would ruin billions of lives. They don't care. So here's, here's what would actually happen. You know, what would, have actually, what would have actually happened in the last several decades is that instead of China and India improving, and of course people always point to the negatives, but their life expectancy is both up by over six years, that's six years of life, and their income is dramatically up, so instead of that happening, that wouldn't have happened, and if we had listened to them, we would have a much lower standard uh, of living. And yet nobody seems to care. So let's say there was a climate catastrophe coming from CO2. Let's stipulate that that was true. We would still have a very different attitude toward fossil fuels. We wouldn't say, oh yay, we get to get off fossil fuels and celebrate it and condemn the industry. We would regard it as a tragedy. And people would be saying to you, look, this is so sad because you, you are heroes who've made our lives possible, who've made the greatest standard of living in history possible. You've done this, and we're so grateful, and yet it turns out there's this tragic flaw and there's no immediate replacement. This is a tragedy. But it's not treated as a tragedy, it's treated as a celebration, which means people don't really care about energy. Now, some people, because they're not taught to care about it or to understand which forms of energy are efficient, but I think the leaders don't care about energy. They care their life, human life. They care about being green which means prioritizing non-human life over human life. That's what it means to be green. So, let's go to the issue of climate now. Looking at it from a human perspective, not a green perspective, a human perspective. So first of all, if we're looking at the issue of climate, we have to throw out the term climate change. This is just a deliberately manipulative term that was popularized because before they had global cooling, and you know, if you flip a coin, you've got half, you know, 50% chance of being global cooling, and 50% chance of being global warming. And they actually got it wrong both times, right? Because they forecast global cooling right before it got warmer, and they, then they said global warming right before the temperature started flattening. So then they say, okay, climate change. This is, you know, a very vague term. The real issue, if you care about human beings, is climate danger. Is putting more CO2 in the atmosphere making the world more dangerous? for human beings, which is a legitimate question because CO2 does have an impact on the atmosphere. But to understand the big picture, we have to look at three questions. So the first one is the greenhouse effect. What kind of warming effect, in, in particular, how big, how consequential is that warming effect of greenhouse gases, CO2 in particular? But we also need to look at two other effects that are never discussed because they're positive effects and we're taught never to think anything positive about fossil fuels. So the second one is, the fertilizer effect. 
We learn in school that CO2 helps plants grow. And yet we never talk about it. We never talk about, hey, maybe putting more CO2 in the atmosphere has been overall good because it's helped plant growth around the world. We don't have a bias. We're not focused on human life. And then the third one is the most important thing that's overlooked, which is what I call the energy effect, which is we're not just producing CO2 for the sake of producing CO2. We're producing CO2 as part of a process of generating energy. And generating energy is really important if you want a livable climate because nature doesn't give us a livable climate. People throughout history were terrified of the climate, terrified of nature. They invented gods to try to appease nature because nature would constantly give them storms and floods and droughts and all these other things. And it's only once we industrialized and developed that we could become a lot less afraid of climate. So one of the things, we, if we care about people having a livable climate, they need plenty of energy. They need energy abundance. If someone says, oh, I'm going to give you energy poverty to save you from climate, you know, that's, that doesn't make any sense. That's like, I'm going to take away your medicine to save you from disease. It just it doesn't work. So we need to look at all of those things. So let's look just quickly at the arc of it. And again, you can, you can check out resources online or you can check out the book. Uh, while I'm at it, let me just mention, you might not be able to see my pen. I have an I Love Fossil Fuels pen here. And we have a bunch of those available at the bookstore for free. I just hope that uh, we have a, a sign-up sheet if you want to stay in touch. And in particular, I want to give you some what I call energy champion materials. So materials that you can just send for free to all of your friends, and particularly your friends outside Kern County, and persuade them. So those are at the, um, those are at the bookstore. If we run out, go to moralcaseforfossilfuels.com, enter your email address, moralcaseforfossilfuels.com. OK, so we've got that. I just want to give you an outline of how this works, and then you can read up on the details as you wish. So if we look at the greenhouse effect, we're going to go through some slides pretty quick. First thing to notice, with any theory, someone says we're going to have catastrophic global warming, first thing I want to know is how long has that theory been around? How has it performed? Short answer, it's been around 40 years. It's completely failed. So we had James Hansen. This is him when he's younger. Oh, I used to have an older picture of him. But he's got, you know, in 1986, he was testifying before Congress, um, or maybe it was just uh, 1986 to 1988, he was doing a lot of testimony before Congress and in the public, and he became famous for saying that our temperature between the years 2000 and 2010 was going to rise between two and four degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if that had happened, that would be really scary because in the 150 years before that, it rose less than one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So that would mean in one decade, you had more warming than you had in 150 years, maybe twice as much warming. So it's worth asking what happened. Now, it didn't happen. And people think, expect it to happen, which is really weird, because if you study how the greenhouse effect works, you wouldn't expect dramatic warming. So here's how the greenhouse effect works. It's really important when we talk about anything to be precise. So if I want to know is there going to be runaway global warming or not? And someone says there's a greenhouse effect. I want to know in mathematical terms what kind of effect this is. So I don't want to make it too mathematical, but there are different kinds of mathematical functions. And what they amount to is this. One interpretation would be every new molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere warms it more than the last. So I'll use a car analogy. Let's say my foot is, I'm putting my foot uh, on the accelerator and I'm at 55 miles an hour. So in this interpretation, which people assume is true, every inch that I push down is going to make the car go faster. It's going to increase its velocity faster and faster and faster. So what that would mean is once I depress the pedal fast enough, I'm going to be a rocket ship taking off through space, right? Because it's going to go faster and faster and faster. It's like an exponential or a geometric function. So that's what people think the greenhouse effect is. Now, if that was true, that would be incredibly scary. It would also be sort of impossible that the Earth used to have, by the way, 20 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere than it used to. If that were true, right, the whole Earth would have burned to a crisp a long time ago. So, or it could be a linear effect, which means every inch you, pet, you push down the gas makes the velocity increase at the same rate. But it turns out it's not even that. It's a decelerating effect, or what's called a logarithmic effect, which means every new molecule warms the atmosphere more than the last bit. So every, it, it, every time you double it, basically, in many interpretations, it only increases at one degree. So what we would expect is not this runaway increase, but a mild impact. And Hansen was wrong. This is exactly what we found. So if you look at this, and just so you get, it's, it's important because you're going to see these graphs all the time. And they, they look really big, but if you notice, the y-axis is like a degree. So it's this very small 
uh, this very small period and they make it look dramatic, but notice that there's a time when we don't use many, much in the way of CO2 emissions and the temperature still goes up. And then we increase it dramatically and it goes up maybe a tiny bit faster, but then be, look at between 2000 and 2010 when Hansen predicted two to four, how much does it go up? Nothing. So he was completely wrong. So he had a theory that somehow, even though it's logarithmic, even though it's decelerating, it's going to somehow, in the atmosphere, lead to this catastrophe. It did not happen, and yet he's not honest enough to own up to it. He just makes crazier and crazier predictions all the time. And the newspaper says, esteemed climate scientist James Hansen, who's gotten the global warming issue right for 40 years, blah, blah, blah. But this is not the truth. This is to just give you context of the amount of warming we're talking about. We're talking about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit in 150 years. This is barely discernible uh, to us. So when people say, oh, it's the warmest whatever in history, what they mean is in this tiny slice of history, it, when we're at the peak of a very, very small trend, it's warmer. I mean, that's like, you know, you're walking up a hill, like a very, very shallow hill with bumps, and you're like, oh, I'm at the highest I've ever been. But yeah, is that, does that matter? Is it a big deal or not? If it's going like this, it would be a big deal. So what's happened is with this idea that, oh, 97% of scientists agree with climate change, that's garbage philosophical thinking because it's not precise. Insofar as that study is, is true, and I, I have an article I can send you called 97% of climate scientists agree is 100% wrong. Insofar as that's true, this is what it means. It means that a lot of scientists agree that we have had some warming influence on the atmosphere, which I agree with. What they don't agree with because they can't prove it remotely, is that this is extremely consequential, let alone that it's detrimental to human life. But what we can prove is that there is a fertilizer effect and an energy effect that are amazingly positive for human life. So let's go to the fertilizer effect. This should be obvious, but we never talk about it. The more CO2 you put in the air, all things being equal, the more plants grow. So when you do it in isolation, this is what it looks like. We have 0.04% we have uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, greenhouses, to grow plants, put three times as much because CO, plants love CO2. These studies have been done on all kinds of different plants and you see over and over and over, the more CO2 you put in, the more plant growth you get. There was an oil executive who gave this great line at a panel I saw one, and you know, he was an oil executive, so I appreciated what he said in particular. He said, if plants could vote, they would vote for coal. Now let's go talk about the, the really big issue, which is danger. Has it really gotten more dangerous? Because that's what I care about. I don't want myself or my future children or my friends or cousins or nieces and nephews or whomever, I do not want them to have an unlivable climate to say the least. So what I'm concerned about is in the last 40 years, as it's been predicted that we're going to have climate disaster, what has actually happened? So a good example is John Holdren. This is our our energy advisor to the president, the leading, most influential scientist in American politics, predicted in 1985 that by the year 2020, we would be, we'd have a billion deaths related to famine caused by fossil fuels. So your industry would be responsible for a billion people dying prematurely. Well, actually we have many more people than we did back then, but malnutrition rates have gone down by 40%. So that means literally billions more people have food who didn't use to have food. And that's not an accident. That's because of fossil fuels. The reason why we have the agricultural revolution in large part is because we have natural gas generated fertilizer and because we have mechanized agriculture powered by diesel fuel. We have a modern harvester that can, that can uh, reap enough wheat for 500,000 loaves of bread a day. Imagine if you strapped a windmill on a harvester or a solar panel, how much it would be able to reap. Or, you know, put an electric battery, it would just be not even close. So your industry has fed the world. I have a section in the book called How the Fossil Fuel Industry Solved World Hunger. And that's not a joke. That is a literal truth in my mind. So let's look at let's look at the data. So we have the data, he was wrong on food, but what about everything else? Isn't it true that storms have gotten more deadly, that floods have gotten more deadly, that heat has gotten more deadly than cold, right? We read about this in the paper all the time, every new storm that kills anyone is blamed on fossil fuels, but that is not a legitimate way of thinking. We need to look big picture overall, what are the trends? And it's interesting because I discovered this stat about five years ago. There's a stat that measures exactly this. It's a stat called climate-related deaths. And it's interesting because the people who supposedly care about climate change will never mention this stat. And the reason is because it totally refutes their theory. 
because they've predicted climate's going to become more dangerous as we put more CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, we, we have, there is something called the International Disaster Database that measures climate-related deaths from heat and cold and floods and storms and everything like that, everything that's supposedly made worse by fossil fuels. So I was really shocked when I learned this data. So what happens? More fossil fuels we use, climate-related deaths plummet. I'll give you a couple of, of specific statistics. In the 30s, which is the first decade we have good data, there's not much data before that, you have several years where there are 3 million or more climate-related deaths around the world. 3 million or more. Adjusted for population, that's 10 million. That would be the equivalent of 10 million a year. People around the world dying from climate. In the year 2013, which is, was the most up-to-date data when I wrote the book, we had under 30,000 die from climate-related causes. So we went from over, from 10 million to under 30,000. So what happened? The narrative is totally backwards. What they say is we've taken a naturally safe climate, they think the climate is perfect, and we've ruined it and made it unsafe. No. The climate is incredibly unsafe naturally. It's variable, it changes all the time, it's volatile, it's vicious. What we've done is we've taken a naturally dangerous climate and made it far, far safer. So the thing to be concerned about with climate is not exactly how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. Again, there's been 20 times more. Now, if, if we got down to half as much as we have now, a lot of plants would die, that would be bad. But it's not, are we putting too much CO2 in the atmosphere? It's, are we giving people the energy and technology they need to make their climate safer and to make every aspect of their life better? And that's what this industry is doing. So it's not just that this industry isn't that bad with regard to climate, it's that this industry is essential with regard to climate livability. We would have a much less livable climate without the fossil fuel industry. And if we restrict it, those poor people in the third world whom all the anti-fossil fuel activists claim to care about, they will be much more devastated by all of nature's climate ravages. So the, there's a lot more detail on that, but I wanted to get, give you some methodology, is that when you think of it from a human basis, it totally changes. Once you think of it from, I care about maximizing human well-being, not minimizing human impact, and you think big picture, thinking carefully about positives and negatives, everything changes. So just to summarize how it applies to the others, with pollution, all we are taught to look at is, oh, how much is the oil industry polluted? But you can't do that. You also have to look at how much is the oil industry cleaning up? Because nature is not a, is not a clean place naturally. And if we look at the state of the earth, our environment has gotten better and better because the number one polluter, the number one da environmental danger to human life is mother nature. So every piece of data we have about even clean air, clean water, because you know you still have to burn wood in your home or coal in your home, everything has gotten better. So it's, it's just like we haven't taken a naturally safe climate and made it dangerous, we've taken a naturally dangerous climate and made it safe, so we haven't taken a naturally clean environment and made it dirty, we've taken a naturally dirty environment and making it far, far cleaner. And the same is true with resources. People think in all of these issues, nature is perfect, we ruin it. Wrong. Nature is not perfect. It's perfectible, it's got lots of potential, it's amazing if we make it amazing. With resources, here's a survey. Who here believes that oil and gas are valuable natural resources? Who believes that they're not valuable natural resources? Okay, we got, I wonder how many of you read the book. Okay, well, the majority is wrong. They are not valuable natural resources because they are not naturally resources, right? We call it a resource, but was oil a resource before Edwin Drake and other heroes figured out how to turn useless cloth into black gold? Oil is naturally useless. What about aluminum, for that matter? Aluminum is one of the most abundant elements in the earth, but it wasn't a resource until human ingenuity transformed it into a resource. So when they say your industry is depleting the earth of resources, I find that to be a disgusting evaluation. No, you're creating new resources. You're finding new ways of turning a non-resource into a resource. And that's what the shale revolution did. Shale revolution basically amounts to someone found a useless rock, and there are two Texans worth of this stuff at least, and they figured out a way to turn a useless rock and use it to charge your iPhone or power your car, right? To generate the energy that would do that. That is amazing. We should be celebrating that. And I think we will celebrate that if we learn how to think about the issue from a human perspective. So to go back to the three concepts, there's the Hydra, 
that's overwhelming us. And it's overwhelming us because there, it has this ideal that allows them to argue to, uh, to 100 and makes us argue to zero, or we choose to argue to zero. But if we challenge the moral standard on which that ideal of getting all fossil fuels is based, if we challenge the moral standard of being green, and we replace it with the moral standard of maximizing human well-being, we discover that fossil fuels are not an unnecessary evil that we need to get off quickly. They're not a necessary evil that we need to get off slowly. They are a superior good that we should be using more and more of as long as they're the best technology on the market. So that is, that is the moral case for fossil fuels, and this needs to be taught to everybody. Unfortunately, it's not taught to anybody. It's getting taught to more people, but I think the number one mistake the industry makes is they think this is a debate about facts when it's actually a debate about moral framework. It's not a debate primarily about facts, it's a debate about moral framework. So all the, everything you do when you talk to people from now on, remember that, that everything needs to be reframed and repositioned into the moral framework of maximizing human well-being. So the moral case for the fossil fuels is the human case for fossil fuels. And my goal in all of this in speaking to you is, in speaking to anyone is, I wanna speak either people that disagree with me that I can convert, or people who agree with me that wanna become champions or thought leaders. And my, my own mission is to create the materials that will empower you uh, to do that. So the moral case for fossil fuels is I think the best thing I've created so far. I'm working on an energy champions course that will help everyone, I think, talk more effectively to their friends and neighbors. But please, um, please go to moralcaseforfossilfuels.com. Please sign up, just give your email, because there's just free stuff. The internet is amazing. We can change the world literally for free if we just share the right framework and the right ideas with the right people. Thank you very much.